Welcome, and today we are on the fourth and final tutorial on our 555 tutorial mini series. So we are going to talk about the A stable configuration, which as I've discussed in the previous tutorials, basically means that in this configuration, the output of the 555 timer does not have a stable place that it wants to settle. And so it oscillates back and forth, back and forth, creating a controllable square wave. So you can change it by changing out your capacitor and your resistor values and doing stuff like that and create a pretty decent square wave. So that's pretty exciting. So this is actually one of the more common, actually they're all pretty common. So I don't know if I can say that, but it seems like one of the more common configurations for the 555 timer. And it's not as simple as the bistable configuration, but it's not as complex to understand what's going on as the monostable configuration. So we'll go over that pretty quick and it should be quite straightforward. Now you would want to use this for creating any square wave, whether that's little trinkets that you want to create noise with, uh, tone generators. I've seen tutorials on metronomes that you can vary the speed of the metronome, things like that by changing um, the resistance using a variable resistor, all sorts of applications. So the A-stable configuration is just basically a way without using an Arduino or a microcontroller or more complex uh, analog circuits, a way to create an easily controllable square wave generator. So let's jump into how the A-stable 555 timer configuration is set up, kind of look at it a little bit, and then we'll jump into our practical where we will see it in action, see how it matches up with reality. And in this case, for some reason, it doesn't match up with reality. And we'll talk about that a little bit and uh, some of the reasons why I think that is. But first, let's talk about the pinout configuration. So, okay. So unlike our bistable configuration, we are not going to be attaching our reset to anything. It's just tied directly to VCC so that we don't accidentally reset things. So really bistable is the only configuration that had, well, that used the reset pin as an integral part of what it was doing. And then you have your typical power and ground. And then for five, that control, we don't want to override the two thirds VCC setting. So a five is just tied to ground via capacitor to get rid of noise, no problem. And then our output, number three. So all of the boring stuff is on the right side of this pinout, and the more interesting stuff is on the left side. Now, the most interesting thing to note here is that pins two and six, which are the trigger and the threshold, are tied together. And that is where you get that instability, is because if you remember, those are tied together on the inside, and we'll jump into that in just a second. And so that is where you get some of those challenges, because you'll cross one threshold, be in kind of a no man's land and then cross another threshold that will cause it to change states and then it'll switch and then it'll be in another threshold. So most of the interesting stuff happens due to the fact that two and six are combined. Now, and you can see here pin seven, that discharge, that capacitor discharge pin is coming into play just like we saw with the mono stable configuration. And then we have these two resistors and our capacitance. And it is by changing these resistors and this capacitor that you can set the frequency, you can set the duty cycle, and you can change everything that you want by varying those. You can make them all bigger, make them all smaller, make R1 bigger, make R2 bigger. And I will just, uh, spoiler, alert, spoiler alert, talk about how the discharge uh, VJT, the internal VJT, can affect our RC calculations. Okay, so. With that, let's jump into what things look like uh, when we first start up. So in this A-stable configuration, let's look at it now that we can see the internals. We can see that the trigger is connected to the lower inverting input, and our threshold is connected to our non-inverting upper comparator input. So we will assume that it's reset and the output is low. And right now, when we just hooked everything up, We've got VCC and it's high, obviously. And we have this capacitor C1 that's still at zero volts. So with that being at zero volts, then our inverting input is below our non-inverting input. So our input to the set pin is high. Whereas since it's low up here, you'll see that the zero volts basically is going to be, be below two thirds VCC, whatever that happens to be. And so our reset 
is low. And so, as we all know, I, at least I keep a handy dandy. I keep a pin on the floor now. I keep a really short um, truth table to quickly reference because I don't have all of this stuff memorized. But now that we know that set is one and reset is zero, the output is, of Q is going to be one, Q bar is going to be zero, and it's going to be inverted. So since Q bar is low, the output will be high. So that is when we first start out, we have that reset immediately, it flips up high because C1 is low, which makes this inverting input lower than the non-inverting input. So S is high, and then we have the opposite on the top comparator. So the R is low, and so we get a high output on Q. So that is our first state. Now, the interesting thing is, is this is our starting state. We'll never get back to this state again as long as it's running. So this is our, we're starting at zero, getting up into the oscillatory states that we're looking for. So with that, let's jump to our next state. Now we are looking at our capacitor charging. So C1 was at zero volts, had nothing over it, uh, excuse, no voltage over it, but eventually C1 will hit a point where it is a higher voltage than one third VCC. So this lower comparator will actually output a zero. Now, looking at our handy dandy truth table, with S and R being zero, we have a memory state. So our output is still high, our Q is still high, and our total output is still high. So there's this point where even though our voltage has raised up enough to change the outputs of these comparators, it doesn't change the output of our SR flip-flop. So we still haven't quite hit the point where we get into the regular oscillations. Okay, now C1, our capacitor, fills up to above two-thirds VCC, and the topmost comparator flips, where the non-inverting input is now higher than the inverting input here at two-thirds VCC, and we are outputting a one, which makes our R, our reset and our SR flip-flop, go high, which makes Q go down and Q bar go high, which makes our output low. Again, the 555 timer is so confusing because it's like this goes high, which causes this, 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 it's, so don't, even though I'm going into that sort of detail, don't let it overwhelm you. Again, the most important things are what's coming out at the end. So in this case, we have finally gotten into the first part of a state that it's going to be seeing over and over again as it's going up and down with the output. But we have now officially dropped our output low because our non-inverting input to our uppermost comparator has gone high. Now, if you remember from the monostable configuration, what happens when the Q bar goes high? Well, this BJT transistor, it starts to conduct because the base has a higher voltage, it starts to conduct a little bit, and we will see this capacitor start to discharge. So let's go to the next state. So now that Q bar is high, our capacitor almost immediately starts to discharge. However, there are two things that are stopping it. One is R2, and that's the overwhelming portion that you should consider. And then two, it is the resistance of this BJT. Now this is the thing, I set this up to have 100 ohms for R1 and R2, and because that is a low enough resistance, lower than the recommendation to be honest, this resistance of the BJT comes into account and messes up my timing, which is kind of interesting. If my resistance and my capacitances were different values, then the internal resistance of the BJT would be low enough that it would be negligible. But because I'm using 100 ohms instead of at least 1,000 or 10,000 ohms, like I probably should be doing, this becomes a problem. So that's something to think about. Now, going back to where we are in this flow, we have now started to discharge our capacitor through R2 and the BJT transistor until we move to the next state. We are going to the point where the capacitor has a low enough voltage that our inverting input on our lower comparator is below 
the one-third VCC input of our non-inverting input for that lower comparator. And due to that, it makes the input to our set pin on our SR flip-flop go high, which makes Q go high. And we just started the process over again. Now it goes high, Q bar goes low, the BJT transistor shuts off, and the capacitor starts to charge again. So we just oscillate between these states, capacitor being high enough that the output's low, the capacitor discharging, capacitor being low enough that the output's high, through over and over and over again, never stabilizing, thus the A-stable configuration. Now, the reason that this BJT transistor may affect things and the timing of all of this is because the width of the high cycle and the width of the low cycle are dependent entirely on the RC timing. So for it to be high, you have the equation where the high output lasts as long as 0.693 times R1 plus R2 times the capacitance. And now when you're doing this, uh, the high width that is not at all dependent on that transistor because it is purely coming from VCC down through R1, through R2, and filling up the capacitor. And so that makes sense. So again, 0.693 times R1 plus R2 times the capacitance. Now for us, it's just 100 ohms times 100 ohms, excuse me, 100 ohms plus 100 ohms, so 200, times uh, what we have here is 0.1 microfarads times 0.693. Now, I did the math, and I'm going to do it again because it went away. But we should come out with about 13.86 seconds for the high pulse of our square wave due to what I have here. Now, let's just assume that's a 50% duty cycle. And so we would expect something around 30... Um, what am I saying here? Yeah, around 30 microseconds for the entire period if we did this. Now, if I wanted that to be a shorter period, I could use even smaller capacitance and, well, I shouldn't use smaller resistors, but I should use significantly smaller capacitors and then bump up my resistors so I have a little bit more uh, of what, a, you know, what I want there. And that's how you change the frequency, is changing the capacitance and the resistance. Now, if you want to change the width of the height versus the low part, change the duty cycle, for example, the better way to say it, is you can change either one R1 or R2 because the equation for the low length of time is actually the same, 0.693 times R2 only times the capacitance. Now you'll note something interesting there is that with this setup, you will ne never ever get less than a 50% duty cycle because your low will always be shorter then you're high because you're, you can't have a negative resistance, not at least in what we're dealing with here. And so whenever you put in that second resistor, it's going to make that time constant longer. So you should always expect a longer rise time because you're trying to get that current through both resistors and a shorter drop-off time because you're just going through R2 and the transistor. So this is, again, where the BJT transistor comes into play. When that BJT transistor is on, it has a resistance, and it affects this equation. Now, again, if my resistances were 100,000 and 100,000 ohms, uh, you know, 50 ohms of a really inefficient transistor, it's not a big deal. But since I'm dealing with 100 ohms, that transistor plays a much bigger factor. So now we've gone over the basic circuit diagram, what the point is. We've also talked about what's going on internally as it's switching between those different states. Now let's set up the camera on the oscilloscope and actually show it in action. And I'll show you also where that BJT transistor causes issues with my timing. All right, so I am providing seven volts to this circuit, which you can kind of see my uh, settings are about 5 volts per division, so 5 volts, 7 volts, that all looks good. And both of these are at the same uh, scale, so that is some, something important to note. What I have here is the yellow is the output from the 555 timer, and the blue is that 
capacitance, the voltage over the capacitor, not the capacitance, I don't know why I said that, it is the voltage over the capacitor that is charging from one third, where you get that high voltage, to two thirds, where then it hits, it drops to the low voltage and is discharging through that discharge pin on the 555 timer until it hits one third VCC, goes high, up and down, up and down, all the way across. Now, like I said, I expected the time, the width right here of it positive to be about 13.86. That was it, 13.86 microseconds, which 14.2 microseconds, not too shabby. However, if I am to take out that 200 and change that to 100 because that's what it should be, then that shows that my low, my low time should be hmm, 6.93 microseconds. 6.93 and I'm at 25.2. That is a huge difference. So this is actually what raised some red flags when I was doing this. Like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And I realized that if I am to take this, if I were to take this, or if I am, I'm going to take this, you can take this voltage and crank it from seven up to the 15 volts that this is designed to take, and you'll notice something very strange. Let's go up to, all right, I'm about, I'm almost to 15 now, 14.8-ish volts. And look at that width. It dropped to 17.6 seconds. Now, this equation doesn't have any time, it doesn't have any voltage portion of it. They, the voltage should not affect it at all. It should not drop by eight microseconds when I basically double the voltage. And so what I think is going on here is that I'm increasing that base voltage at that BJT transistor and it is, well, I don't know if that's the correct term, it's closing the transistor more. It's decreasing that resistance, which is making it so it discharges the capacitor even faster, which is really fascinating. And again, if I used 1,000 ohms, 10,000 ohms, well, you know, something that I should have used, this wouldn't be playing a factor in it. Um, so that is something that you should pay attention to when you're selecting the different values you have for your 555 timer, is not only using 100 ohms, make it so that, that this dissipates more power than necessary, it also is messing up the timing because it has some real life issues that it needs to overcome. So. I left this here even though I realized my mistake just because I thought it was an interesting teaching moment. So that's it. That's the A-stable configuration of the 555 timer. We've gone over the setup, the circuit diagram. We've talked about what is going on internally. We've talked about some of the real life things that you should pay attention to and why you shouldn't use the values that I used here. We saw in action over here. I think that's fun. It's always fun. You know me. I, I love seeing things in action, seeing the real life applications. If you did find this useful, fantastic. Give this video a like. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel, all that good stuff, and we will catch you in the next one. We hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. Did you know that circuitbread.com has other useful engineering content? In addition to many other features, we have study guides that cover a wide variety of engineering topics at a high level, with equations and diagrams to make it easy to quickly review and reference. Go check them out.